Now, I have the great honor and privilege to introduce the chairman of our first session. This is my Berkesonian effort. All I can say is he's a world-class scholar, bon vivant, connoisseur of wine, lover of beer, and the lucky husband of Lorraine Herwig, yours truly. <laughs> With that, let us move on to our program, please. Thank you. I trust you have all gotten your programs. If not, they're at the back. In there, you will have brief bios of both of our speakers. I will not take their time with lengthy introductions. First off, my colleague Pat Brennan, Professor Emeritus in History here, scholar of World War I. Next to me is Michael Epkenhans, a dear friend of some three decades standing, but who's counting, right? mainly a historian of the German Navy, a superb one. Occasionally he moonlights in military history as well with his colleagues in Potsdam. They are going to set the larger stage for us from which we can then go down into other aspects of Vimy. So let us start with Dr. Brennan, please. Thank you very much, uh, Holger. When we were planning this conference uh, many, many months ago, uh, the one thing I insisted upon was that somebody talk about the Canadian home front, because too often in Canadian military history conferences, that's sort of omitted. Um, I assumed someone would apply to give a talk uh, on that subject. No one did. And uh, Dr. Herwig then looked me in the eye and in one of those cases of life imitating art, I suppose, given the nature of my topic, he looked at me like Sir Robert Borden, looked at many of the people I'm going to talk about, and said, you're up, laddie. So <laughs> I was conscripted, but not unwillingly, I might add. <laughs> By the end of 1917, the impact on Canada of what contemporaries called the Great War had been profound. On the military side, a very capable army, led by talented commanders, had been built from the rawest of raw materials. Among the single signal achievements of 1917, of that four division strong colonial corps of the British Expeditionary Force, were the capture of the supposedly unassailable German position at Top Vimy Ridge in April, on which this conference will focus its attention, as well as the launch of a textbook attack on Hill 70 in August, and under appalling conditions, the capstone advance at Passchendaele in October, November. In achieving these battlefield successes, the 100,000-man strong Canadian Corps had paid a heavy price, suffering 62,000 casualties. The Anglo-Canadian majority, Anglo majority of the country had gone to war willingly in 1914, even if, as a colony of the British Empire, Canada had not had the right to declare war in its own right. During the next two and a half years, Canadians had persevered, despite having to make enormous collective sacrifices and bear enormous individual pain. By 1917, a great many from the majority British Canadian community hoped that a Canadian nation, which would constitute more than just an outpost of the British Empire, was coming into being, and that a fundamentally different and surely a better, more just society would emerge from the struggle. At the same time, irreconcilable differences between English and French speakers over whether the conflict was truly Canada's war was freeing national unity to the breaking point. Deteriorating class relations and, deepening, and the deepening malaise of war weariness only added to the gloom. By 1917, the focus was on voluntary enlistment, or rather the lack of it. For the British Canadian majority, which constituted just under 60% of the colony's population, the problem was obvious. French Canadians manifest failure to do their duty. The figures for French Canada, and especially its heartland of Quebec, were indeed dismal. The province's francophone majority, which accounted for about 30% of the colony's potential military manpower, had provided less than 5% of the Canadian Expeditionary Force's strength. On the surface, the figures for British Canadians, who in contrast had provided about 90% of the enlistments who served overseas, were truly impressive. But fully 49% of these soldiers were British immigrants, leaving barely half of our overseas contingent born in Canada, with those, of course, overwhelmingly men of 
British descent. Yet British immigrants, the group providing 49% of the overseas force, comprise somewhat less than 20% of Canada's population. In this light, it is hardly any wonder that German soldiers often saw their Canadian opponents as English as Soldaten. When pondering the very low numbers of French Canadian volunteers, we can at least understand the factors which discourage their enlistment. But what constrains significant numbers of Canadian born of British descent from enlisting before voluntary recruitment virtually dried up in the middle of 1916? Such potentially troubling questions were set aside in 1917. Within the Anglo Canadian community, those who believed the cause was worth dying for, whether fighting for king and empire or latterly, for many, fighting as an ally with its implications of nationhood and equality, had already enlisted. It being unconscionable to break faith with those who had died, their loved ones believed it was now time for other citizens to take their place. If these slackers could not bring themselves to see their clear duty, they should be compelled to see it. It would be conscription, 100,000 more men for an expeditionary force, which already over 100, 400,000 had voluntarily joined, but one which was in dire need of replacements. If the Canadian Corps was to be sustained in the field at pledged manpower levels, which were themselves now seen as sacred promises. The result was the most bitterly contested election in our history in which a temporary fusion of the Conservatives and most English-speaking Liberals campaigned under Prime Minister Robert Borden's unionist banner on a single issue. Vigorous prosecution of the war and its necessary corollary, conscription for overseas service. Opposed under the leadership of Sir Wilfrid Laurier and what remained of the Liberal Party were the vast majority of French Canadians and most of the new Canadians, the polite phrase for continental European immigrants, neither of whom felt the emotional attachment to Anglo-Canadians' mother country and hence viewed Canada's war commitment more dispassionately. But opposed as well were also a substantial number of Anglo-Canadians, especially farmers and urban working men. Of course, a great many of these two groups merely opposed conscription, not the war per se, a fact which considerably complicated the Liberals' campaign strategy. On April 9, 1917, the Canadian Corps, an army that had not existed 33 months earlier, successfully stormed Vimy Ridge in the most successful attack of its size mounted by British Empire forces up till that time. A mere 64 days later, the Military Service Act, conscription for overseas service, uh, was tabled in the House of Commons. In a sincere but vain hope that the country might somehow hold together, Prime Minister Borden promised that the actual conscripting would be delayed until the electorate had spoken, hence the aforementioned election. There was plenty of sincerity, conviction, and unfortunately moral certainty on both sides of the argument. With a predictable result, the campaign started badly and got steadily meaner in spirit. In the English language press, which lined up solidly behind the Unionist cause, opponents were portrayed as misguided or more likely in league with the Kaiser himself. Canadians would either do their duty, bringing honor to Canada, or they would slink from the field, staining the nation's reputation forever. As Unionist posters reminded the undecided, in the hands of a patriot, the ballot was a bullet, and a victory by Laurier and his supporters would be as disastrous as a Hun victory on the battlefield. If the rhetoric sank to similar depths in the French language press in Quebec, it should be added, only there, les maudits d'anglais were doing nothing less than the devil's work, preparing to sacrifice les jeunes hommes de Quebec on the altar of imperialism. 1917, or sorry, on the surface, the polling result on December 17, 1917, was clear cut enough, returning Prime Minister Borden's unionists to government with 57% of the popular vote. Yet the franchise had been shamelessly manipulated by the Wartime Elections Act in particular. This legislation disfranchised immigrants from enemy countries who were naturalized British subjects but had reached Canada before 1896, that is virtually all Ukrainians, most of whom had emigrated from Austria-Hungary and about one half of the German speakers, most of them having also come from Austria-Hungary. Even more blatantly, it had enfranchised the close female relatives of serving or deceased soldiers the vast majority of whom, given enlistment demographics, were of British descent. 
Combine these measures with the fevered propaganda inundating Anglo-Canadian voters when the election result was actually remarkably close. Simply enfranchising all women without regard to how they were likely to vote, or none at all, as had been the previous situation, and allowing law-abiding British subjects who happened to be from Austria-Hungary to cast a ballot would have substantially closed, if not erased, the unionist plurality of 264,000 votes, which is, of course, precisely uh, why the restrictive voting measures were adopted in the first place. But that just over one-third of the votes cast in British-Canadian-dominated sections of the country went against the pro-conscription cause should make us question just how united were even Anglo-Canadians behind a fight to the last man and the last dollar. Almost a year to the day after Vimy, April 1st, 1918, the culmination of four days of anti-conscription rioting in Quebec City saw soldiers of the Canadian Expeditionary Force opened fire on a crowd of protesters, killing four, including a 14-year-old boy. Although it was no massacre, and its aftermath, dozens of soldiers had to be treated in hospital, some for gunshot wounds, it was widely remembered as one, certainly in Quebec. Nobly resisting conscription and steadfastly opposing French Canada's being put in its place marked the abrupt end of one vision of Canada. A generation after the First World War, novelist Hugh McLennan would aptly phrase the poisoned relationship between English and French Canadians as the two solitudes. The conscription crisis of 1917-1918 was the culminating act of the steady deterioration in relations that had been unfolding at least since the 1880s. But it is difficult to see the wartime exacerbation of divisions as other than a major contributing factor to the deep disillusionment that a generation of Francophone Quebecers felt toward Canada in the aftermath of these unhappy events. French Canadians were not the only community to have their loyalty questioned. German Canadians, at 6% of the population, the largest non-British, non-French community in Canada, were viciously pilloried for their supposed allegiance to the Kaiser and a German state in which only a few had ever set foot. The crimes which made most Ukrainian Canadians suspect were being poor and having Austria-Hungary stamped on their immigration documents. The so-called enemy aliens became a problem during the war, not because they were disloyal, but because the many native-born Anglo-Canadians who had never accepted their presence for cultural reasons now viewed them as the enemy within. Anglo-Canadian patriots unburdened a number of communities of their German names, with Berlin, Ontario, which became Kitchener in 1916, being the most famous. German Canadians, immigrant and native-born, were fired by their Anglo-Canadian employers. German-owned businesses were boycotted and even vandalized in not a few instances in broad daylight and in the presence of the police. Thousands of families anglicized their surnames. In 1917, Gotthard Maron, editor of Der Nordwesten, the leading German language newspaper on the prairies where most of the recently arrived German speakers had settled, confided despairingly to the national press censor and I quote, what good can the storing up of animosity do to Canada? Will it foster assimilation? Will it develop love of the country? The very object which such outpourings of impatience and antagonism mean to achieve will be defeated by it. German Canadians had little choice but to accommodate their new reality, but an eloquent statement was made by one of the country's most established German communities when William Euler, the former mayor of Berlin, Ontario, carried the riding of Kitchener in one of the rare Liberal Party victories in Ontario on December 17. Sadly, the 1921 census provided an even clearer verdict, recording one-third fewer Canadians claiming German parentage than a decade earlier, with matching rises in the numbers claiming Dutch and Scandinavian heritage, even though there had been little immigration of any kind since 1913, and few German Canadians had left the country. The war was fought by the peoples of the British Empire for many reasons, but not the least, as propagandists phrased it, to build a home fit for heroes, a society which would be more economically and socially fair to all citizens and thus serve as a worthy memorial to the war's tragic sacrifices. In wartime Canada, the plight of the disadvantaged called out for such reforms, but the response from the Borden government had been almost invisible. Ottawa's reluctant acceptance of its responsibility for disabled veterans and the families of the deceased proved a modest, if lonely, exception. The lot of the mostly working-class families of serving soldiers speaks volumes, dependent as they were for assistance on the increasingly inadequate 
handouts of a charity, the Patriotic Fund. Yet by 1917, the Home Fit for Heroes goal was being embraced by growing numbers of middle and working class Anglo-Canadians, motivated by everything from social gospel Christianity to a basic desire for workers' empowerment and vaguely socialist ideas. As the Methodist newspaper, The Christian Guardian, enjoined its readers in August 1917, the old theory of the sacredness of property is bound to be shouldered aside by the new theory of the sacredness of life. A square deal for every man will be the national motto. In this way, the war promises to bring the kingdom of God nearer to us. The worn argument that winning the war must precede domestic reform no longer resonated for a great many men and women in the sole national community which still supported the war effort and, those, and whose votes were essential to carry conscription. Crowds at patriotic rallies echoed the call for not just the conscription of men, but the conscription of wealth, or in the fiery slogan of the day, Canadians should either fight or pay. To facilitate the latter, as well as solicit support at the polls, Ottawa introduced in 1917 tentative taxes on the personal income of the wealthy and the excess profits of business. War was an especially embittering experience for working class Canadians who bore proportionately the heaviest human and economic costs. Within business circles, anti-union attitudes, if anything, had been intensified by the war. Workers should be glad to have a job, enjoined Sir Joseph Lavelle, the head of the Imperial Munitions Board, a consortium of private concerns whose shell factories by 1917 constituted the country's largest industrial employer. Flagrant injustices of wartime profiteering and beginning in late 1917, a vicious cycle of inflation eroding working class incomes hung over the country like a pall and only added to the cynicism felt by the working, among many in the working class and many among the middle class as well. Not surprisingly, many workers looked to the small but expanding trade union movement as a vehicle for reform. Despite entrenched opposition from the capitalist class, growing labor shortages throughout 1917, temporarily gave workers leverage in extracting improved wages and working conditions, and most importantly, recognition of their unions, raising hopes that would be roundly dashed in the war's immediate aftermath. For working class families, the fate of the silent march on Sunday, June 21st, 1919, a peaceful protest by thousands of men, women, and children, which marked the effective end of the Winnipeg general strike put paid to hopes that had been kindled in 1917. There was a bitter irony that day, given the numbers of Canadian Corps veterans among those who were bludgeoned by the mounted police along Portage Avenue. The grinding defeat over those six weeks in May and June 1919 of the workers and their dependents, fully half of the population of the country's third largest city, and simultaneously, the hopes of so many other Canadian workers and their families for a decent life constituted a sort of domestic hundred days but with defeat, not victory, to show for their sacrifices. The labor movement, and with it the cause of social justice in Canada, was set back for a generation. These sad events lay in the future, however. The Unionist Party's fears in the autumn of 1917 that the Anglo-Canadian working class would vote for anti-conscription labor candidates proved unfounded. Indeed, the votes went overwhelmingly to the government as the appeals to patriotism and British-Canadian identity embodied in conscription proved stronger than class allegiance, at least for a time. But this only temporarily masked the serious divisions within the British Canadian community in 1917, which included not just the alienation of the working class, but growing numbers of Prairie and Ontario farmers fed up with the economic and political status quo as well. Unquestionably, 1917 was marked by nobility of Canadian sacrifice. The extent to which there was a point to the sacrifice, that it was in our national interest, was questioned by substantial numbers of Canadians, and not just those outside the dominant British Canadian community. The war experience of such groups in 1917, though markedly different, was equally valid. There is no question that Anglo-Canadians, seriously divided on key questions during the war, though they might have been, experienced a collective national awakening, whereby a great many began to feel at least as Canadian as British. A lasting sadness of our country's experience of the Great War on the home front surely must be that a made in Canada Anglo-Canadian identity, which finally started to emerge, by 1917 is distinct from an adopted imperial one still fell well short of accommodating the equally heartfelt vision of most French Canadians. The home front war experience, no more clearly than in the grim year of 1917, left Canada itself a casualty of the war. 
The march to sovereignty was underway, a singular achievement directly attributable to the impact of the war and Prime Minister Robert Borden's fierce personal commitment to gaining autonomy and respect from the mother country. And the history of our soon-to-be sovereign dominion would be emblazoned with accounts of valor and sacrifice, with Vimy Ridge occupying the apex. But the war had cost Canada a lot more than its collective innocence, as was the case in France and Belgium. On the home front, it was attritional warfare too. And unlike in the world of the Canadian Corps over there, many of the battles fought out on the home front were not victories. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Let me next introduce Professor Michael Epkenhans, renowned scholar, great friend, and head of one of the finest military history research organizations in the Western world. Thank you. Dear Holger, first of all, many thanks again for your kind words, and uh, dear colleagues, it's a great pleasure as well as an honor for me to be back again here after I came here for the first time in 2001 for a conference, and uh, I have always enjoyed it since then, being here and uh, learning a lot from you as well as many other people around. Let me make two remarks, as historians always do. First, I changed the title of my paper slightly, you know, or you always have a last-minute idea. And secondly, what you can see here is the main building of our institute at Potsdam, which, and this is also an irony of history, belonged to the imperial family uh, until the end of the Second World War, and our last empress spent uh, almost two weeks there at the end of the war after her husband had uh, gone into exile in, in the Netherlands in 1918 uh, until she moved somewhere else. So this is the main building. Uh, where we are in, and you're always welcome to visit us. In December 1916, in December 1916, a German social democratic magazine published a caricature showing the world bleeding white after two years of war. Regarding German as well as Allied losses in the year which was coming to an end now, the message that this was that this slaughter should come to an end, the sooner the better. The great battles of Verdun at the Somme and in the East only had shown that both sides had suffered more than two million casualties in the 12 months preceding the publication of this caricature. Most importantly, despite these enormous casualties, victory was not in sight for either side. The front lines, neither in the west nor in the east, had hardly changed. The same was the case in the south of Europe, where Austrians and Italians uh, had in vain uh, tried to get the upper hand in endless battle at the Isonzo. Romania's entry into the war in August 1916, meant to support the Allied attempt to win the war uh, simultaneous, by simultaneously attacking uh, from all sides had only further enlarged the theater of war, but not helped to decide it. Even at sea, where after two years of... Even at sea, where after two years of... Uh, rusting away in their respective harbors, the largest fleets of the time had fought a spectacular battle in May. Nothing had changed. The Germans had knocked at the gate of their cage, but they had not been able to open it. Against this background, the German government knew that the nation was somehow standing at the crossroads. The war had come to an end the sooner the better. But how and under which conditions could this aim be achieved? Following 
The unexpectedly quick victory over Romania in December, the German government offered peace. To the great astonishment of the Allies, and many neutrals as well as the public at home, Chancellor Bettmann Holweg, you can see him standing in the middle, Chancellor Bettmann Holweg declared in mid December before Parliament that Germany would be willing to end the war. Until today, historians doubt that this was indeed a serious offer. On the one hand, it is quite obvious that the German government thus uh, undermine, tried to undermine an American peace move of which it was fully aware. On the other hand, the German refusal to reveal its war aims, even to a neutral medi mediator, justifies allegations that this move was hardly more than a propaganda coup, which, when it came to nothing, because of the Allies' refusal to enter into neg negotiations, would pave the way for the decision to decide the war by trying to win it within the next few months. On the front, both in the West and in the East, the Germans were de depleting their resources. Only to, uh, to the superiority of the Allies regarding men and material, uh, due to the, uh, to, due to the material, to, due to the superiority of the Allies regarding men and material, it was only a question of time when the Germans would have to give in. So why not use the only weapon which seemed apt to force the Allies upon their knees by cutting, off, cutting them off of their resources, the submarine? If no grain or meat, if no iron ore, sulfur or weapons, and men reached the British Isles, perfidious Albion, as the Germans called the British, would be forced to surrender. Meticulously, German admirals, supported by numerous economists, had tried to prove that this was a realistic aim due to Britain's dependence upon supplies from overseas. When it was clear that the Allies would not enter into negotiations, the government decided to open unrestricted submarine warfare beginning on February 1, 1917, even if this meant that the United States would enter the war on the side of the Allies sooner or later. From the German point of view, this risk was calculable because the Navy promised to have won the war before the United States had fully mobilized. From hindsight, the German decision was, of course, a high-risk gamble similar to the Moltke Schlieffen plan from, of 1914, which had also tried to win the war with one single stroke. In the, ages, in, in the eyes of the uh, decision makers, it was by no means a, a gamble, but a logical step in a strategy to end the war. If German submarines surrounded the British Isles like sharks killing everybody swimming in the water, you can see it here, Germany had to win. And as well as uh, we, we all know, the spectacular successes in the early months of the campaign, see it here, in the early months of the campaign seemed to justify this decision. What the Germans had, however, not foreseen was that any move would provoke a counter move, and this time uh, in the form of convoying ships like in former times, or developing new anti-submarine weapons uh, like the death charge. This result, however, became only visible in the later course of the year. Rather, when the United States, here, when the United States declared war upon Germany, this was taken up with great relief. After almost three years of insecurity about the role of the United States, such an outcome seemed preferable to a state in which the Germans had renounced on the use of their sharpest sword or made compromises which had proved worthless. The feeling of relief seemed justified because the Germans seemed to be on the verge of finally winning the war in the East. <clears throat> 
after enormous losses, hunger and frustration, had uh, enormous losses, hunger and frustration in, about uh, the Tsar's autocratic regime had led to a revolution which swept it away within days in March 1917. Although the new government seemed, the new Russian government seemed willing to stay in the war on the side of Russia's ally, strong factions within the revolutionary movement demanded immediate peace without annexations and contributions. In order to support this movement, not its aims, this is important to note, the Germans had helped one of Russia's most extreme revolutionary, uh, Lenin, to travel to Russia from Switzerland through Germany. Only in late 1918, the Germans began to realize that they had thus let a ghost out of the bottle they could not control and which, after victory in Russia, was determined to revolutionize the West as well. Signs of increasing unrest were, however, clearly visible in Germany in early 1970, in early 1917 too. Here we have the Russian Tsar. Until 1916, the so-called fortress truce declared in 1914 had by and large helped to close ranks within society. Like in Russia, however, more and more people had become tired of the war. The turnip winter of 1916-17, which had followed a wet summer, which had destroyed large parts of the potato crop, had caused widespread hunger. Moreover, people had to freeze in their homes for months due to the lack of coal. Food rations became smaller every month, and as a result, women had to queue for hours for bread, if it was available at all, while prices continued to rise steadily. Many items were only available on the black market. This, in turn, increased social tensions between the haves who, kept, who could afford these prices and the have-nots who could not. You can see uh, young students cultivating a former public part in Berlin uh, for agriculture. These hardships and tensions coincided with the strain caused, caused by the so-called auxiliary service law. All men able to unable to serve on the front, were now forced to work for the German war effort. However, not only men had to work, but women as well, increasing the hardships they had to endure even more. To the great astonishment of the government, these hardships were eventually responsible for the first widespread strikes in Germany in early 1917. Thousands of workers down tools to achieve better working and living conditions. Like a writing on the wall, many of those who demonstrated in the streets demanded an end of the war and political reform. The spark from Russia had obviously sprung over to Germany as well. Even more remarkable in this, this context is the political le that the political left, which had begun to split before, even before, began to rally behind more radical anti-war politicians than before. How did the German government react to this? First, it renewed its promise of political reform after the victorious end of the war only. Secondly, it accepted that a majority of the Reichstag passed a resolution demanding peace without annexations and contributions in mid-July. However, what did this mean for the further course of the war? In short, nothing. Rather, the fact that Germany's high command, with not to forget support of the majority of the political parties in the Reichstag, had successfully ousted Chancellor Bethmann Hollweg, a moderate, out of office and replaced him with uh, an unexperienced man who would follow its wishes as well, as the founding of the Fatherland Party in September with the support of Germany's political and military leadership made clear that the latter was by no means willing to sue for peace. Of course, 
the Allied offensives. This is German war aims. The Allied offensives uh, in the West were a terrible drain for Germany's resources. However, final victory in the East We have here German troops entering Riga in 1917, in early September. And then we have Operation Albion, the first amphibious operation, by the way, uh, more or less at the same time. Of course, the final victory in the East in late 1917, as well as the great success in Italy, uh, at the same time nourished the idea to try to deal a final blow again, now in the West. One successful strike and the war would be over, at least this was the assumption. As a result, all warnings that the risks were too high were ignored. In its Christmas, in its Christmas issue, even the Social Democratic magazine, a very critical one, seemed to support the idea that strength and pride could overcome any obstacle. Instead, a year later, as we all know, the army had returned home, beaten on the battlefields, and the monarchy didn't exist anymore, and the country was torn by revolutionary factions fighting for a dem democratic, a Bolshevik, or a Bol even a Bolshevik Germany. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. You know we have a successful start because we're running late. Nancy, how much time do we have for questions? Five minutes. Would anyone like to start us off? Please say who you are and address your question to either Pat Brennan or Michael Epkenhans. Oh, yeah. And there are microphones that you can speak into, Mr. Flavel, so we can hear you better. Uh, I can just speak loudly. My answer, I will give you questions. My questions for your doctor. I've lost um, the, the military voting during 1917 election. The, uh, I, I came across uh, an argument that said that, that was influenced by the leadership. And when you look at the numbers, like 90%, over 90% of soldiers vote for the Unionist government when their votes are cast in various places. And you seen anything to support the idea that that was, that, that soldiers were colluded into voting a certain way? Well, there's plenty of evidence in terms of, uh, in some cases, not even having a secret ballot, but voting you know, orally in front of their officers. It, uh, was influenced to pressure them. There's a lot of stuff been written about this. Des Morton years ago wrote a piece about liberal campaigners not being allowed access to the troops and so on and so forth. I guess my own personal view is, given the demographic that most of those troops were drawn from, overwhelmingly British Canadian and sort of half of them British immigrants, um, the, the net result, despite all the pressing and shenanigans, was probably pretty accurate, okay? The, the obvious... Uh, Counter to that would be uh, something you might point to was the Australian experience in which the army voted slightly, but did vote in favor of no conscription twice in both the referendums. And so the assumption is the soldiers don't want any more war, don't want their brothers coming over. But I think probably that result was pretty, my personal feeling is it was pretty fair. I haven't seen anything that would lead me to believe that, that despite the <laughs> efforts to influence the vote, that the vote came out the way it kind of would have anyway, maybe not 90%, but, but uh, pretty strongly in favor. Other questions, please. You're all going to be shy this morning. Yes, ma'am. To be honest, I can't. 
Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Washington State also. Well, it's a very reasonable assumption. For one thing, the government of Canada had that assumption, at least a more enlightened element, that made some effort to understand French Canadian feelings, and particularly in Quebec. Uh, I always tell my students when they ask that question that it was a really smart question, because it, you know you spend most of the class telling them how the Canadians, English Canadians, couldn't see themselves as other than Brits, and and so obviously it should feel the same way. French Canadians. It, it's a long history here, but suffice to say that what, that was a non-starter in Quebec. Uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, at the time of the conquest and sort of the French Canadian collective memory of the conquest at the end of the Seven Years' War was that they'd been, at least for a significant number, was they'd been abandoned by France, okay? Uh, probably a lot more telling was, uh, you know, the, all the debates between the Catholic Church and French Republicanism and liberalism and others, various other isms, all of which were bad from the point of view of the Church, in France, uh, in the latter part, center, middle and latter part of the 19th century, you know, the ultramontane controversies and all of that. The French Canadian clergy and most French Canadian Catholics were conservative on that issue, and they, they, a lot of them saw France, that is the government of France, the institutions of France, as, as getting their just comeuppance. But that's maybe, from the Germans, that's maybe a bit too harsh, but there was very little sympathy for modern France, the Republic, okay? The same sort of issues that tore France apart, actually. You know, we're tearing, you know, French Canadians took a side in that, okay? Um, so, when, for example, um, Marshal Joffre was brought over to try to, you know, figure to be better than the Union Jack, to have a French general there um, at a recruiting rally, it was, that was a non-starter. And of course, the issues ran very deep within Canada. For I think it's fair to say, for many French Canadians, this was the proverbial straw that broke the proverbial camel's back. A long history of uh, um, cultural subordination and, and and not being allowed to help define the country and so on. And this was it. You want your war, you have your war. You go off and fight in your war. Uh, so. The French thing was a non-starter, although, as I say, the more coolly rational English Canadians, which was a small group uh, at this time, uh, do try to use this. They, they, again, it reflects more, in many ways, more about how they feel, that this divided loyalty that they feel to a country and to a, a, a mother country. They just can't understand why everybody else doesn't feel the same way. You know? Thank you, Pat. Thank you to the panel. This morning, we'll sort of catch up a little bit. And, of course, Nancy has a mystery gift. I have no idea what it is. That's for you, Michael. Pat, it's yours. And I'd like to welcome my former shipmate, David Berkison, this morning. Glad you could make it up at the crack of dawn. <laughs> and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you.